What's up, tubers? Teal here, Simplistic Fishing. Back at you tonight for another lake breakdown, but this one's going to be a special one. We actually got a request from Lane, one of our subscribers. He's a 14 year old that actually fishes high school bass fishing up in Illinois and asked us to break down one of his lakes that they fish in the tournaments. So, Lane, this one's for you. We're actually going to break it down. And then after that, we're actually going to talk about the lures and the approach that we would use for this lake. And for the rest of you, I really think it is worth watching this one, even though it is up in Illinois, maybe not exactly where all these subscribers live, but it gives you a good chance to see a lake where Google Earth doesn't tell us everything that's there. So it gives you the opportunity to see how I would go approach a lake that I know nothing about and then see what I can find there in order to be able to fish around it. So let's go ahead and jump into this one. Layton, this one's for you. Make sure to share it with your buddies out on the high school fishing team. The rest of you, come along. Let's go. All right, first thing we like to do before we go break down any lake is go out to the state's fishing page and see what kind of information we can find. So here on the Washington County Lake, you can see the county is in Washington. Acreage is 248 acres, average depth 18.24 feet, and the shoreline length is only 14.6 miles. So this is a fairly small lake, right? Only 248 acres. The uh, There are restricted to a 10 horsepower uh motor so be aware of that now if you look over here on the right side i can't open it up because the way that my uh my editing does but you can click on this little fish attractor locations map and it will give you details of 11 different fish attractors that have been set up on this lake and i think that is going to be absolutely key to finding fish on this lake because you'll see as we go through the google earth side it was somewhat difficult to find too much on this just because this lake doesn't fluctuate much Let's go down and look at a couple more things before we switch over to the Google Earth side. Uh, right in here, you can kind of see uh, the full, you can click on this to give you the full PDF report of the fishing outlook. But really the key thing I wanted you to focus on here was the largemouth bass. It talks about the electronic fishing survey that they did. Um, looks like they're doing pretty good and they continue to stock them. The other thing I wanted to point out to you was right here, history and status of the sports fishery. You can see it right here. It is, says that gizzard shad were collected in high numbers, which is expected for a forage species. So to me, that is absolutely critical. You know there's going to be gizzard shad in here. That's their primary forage. So start to match all your baits up to a gizzard shad. Your crankbait should be gizzard shad colors. Um, pretty much everything you do should be revolved around kind of what gizzard shad do and how they behave. All right, so then we're going to move a little bit further down. It's really cool on this page. It talks about the last tournaments that were here. So it talks about the, there were five tournaments held in this water body in 2022. This is the largest bass that was caught, 5.81. So now you guys are gonna think I'm crazy, but to us here in Texas, that's a big bass, but it's not a giant bass. So to me, I think maybe we should downsize the lures a little bit more. Maybe don't go too giant here because we may be kind of getting out of our realm, but we can still go pretty big with five pounders that are out there. That's a, that's a very healthy fish. All right, and then I think that's about it for this page. What we'll do is we're gonna switch over. We're gonna take a look at it on Google Earth. I'll show you guys where I found those laydowns. I'll show you a couple areas where there's rocks and things like that. And I'll point out those fish attractors to you. And then we're gonna switch over and we're gonna talk about the eye boating side. Um, from there, what we'll do is we'll look at the contours and stuff like that. And I'll show you a couple offshore spots that I think might be good for you. So let's go ahead and switch over. Let's go to the Google Earth side. Well, here we are over in Google Earth, and the first thing I want to talk to you about is really just how we have everything categorized on this breakdown. So, um, again, there wasn't a lot that I could find on here other than just a bunch of laydowns and stuff like that, but I'll explain to you what's going on here, so hopefully it'll all make sense. But we have it organized by, number one, the fish attractors. That's what I was talking about earlier when we were on the Illinois fishing page. Those are the fish attractors that we talked about, so those are all marked now. Uh, so you'll know which ones to, to look at. And then we have several laydowns on the Google Earth side that I was just able to find. Now, the problem here is usually like on a Texas lake or on some of the other lakes where uh, the water fluctuates a lot, I could come up here to the northern side and come in here and just draw the, the lake down by using this little imagery button. And it would take me down to when the water was really low. Now you can see here, I mean, the water does get somewhat low, but it's not really changing. The, the level of the water is just not changing very much at all. 
So because of that, you know, there's not a lot that I can show you from a Google Earth standpoint to, to really point out to you. So what I've done is I've gone through here and I've marked the laydowns and we'll go talk about them real quick and just kind of maybe just talk about a few of them here and there, but there's nothing too major. There's also a couple ramps on this lake as well. One's for the smaller boats. I believe that's this one up here. And then this one's for all the other boats. Um, so you have a couple ramps you could fish around, but they're probably gonna be pretty busy being that there's only two ramps here. There is very little rock on this lake. Very, very, very little rock that I can see. Now there could be other rock down there below the trees um, that I'm not able to get to with the imaging, but the only rock that I really could find were down here uh, in this little parking area. We have all the riprap. Basically, it's all the man-made stuff, all this riprap here as well. And then when you go up by the main uh, boat ramp, you've got that rock up there too. There's also a couple of docks on this lake, not very many, but you can definitely go check those out. And then channels and ditches, that's going to be uh, these tracks that are here. Normally, what this would do is if we drew the water down, you'd be able to set in those channels and really fish around those channels. For the most part in this lake, what this is going to help you out with is just knowing where the main flows are going to be coming in, where most of the oxygen is. And then last but not least, we also have some offshore hotspots that I want to talk to you guys about as well. So let's just put all this back on real quick and let's just go through it pretty quickly. I'm not going to do like I normally do where we go into every single detail. But let's just kind of scroll around and just look at it real quick. There's that first brush pile. Here's your rip wrap. Also, when you're down here by the dam, this looks like a fence or something like that. You guys probably know that have been there. But those fish, they like to hang really tight against stuff like this. Like if you find a fence line that comes out anywhere, you know, you can almost guarantee there's a fish somewhere hugging really tight to that fence line. So angle your boat in a way that you can cast parallel with that fence line as opposed to banging up against it or coming at it from this side. Also, all of this riprap. Now, again, this is all about boat positioning because if you're sitting out here and you're casting towards the bank, you're not going to do yourself very much good and you're missing a lot of your opportunities. You're going to have to get your boat positioned to where you're parallel with these banks and casting parallel with them. And that's going to give you a lot more success. There's also a brush pile out there too. As we come out here, our brush pile or fish attractor, not sure what they make their fish attractors out of. As you come in here, there's lots of little laydowns back in here and I'm sure there's even more that I can't see. So when I see all these laydowns, just visually see them when, when I can't even pull the water down, it makes me believe that there's probably a ton, a ton, a ton of laydowns in this lake, especially ones that we couldn't see. And if we were able to draw the water back, I bet we'd see even more. So what we're going to do when we get done talking about this Google Earth side, we're going to switch over, we'll do the eye boating. Then we're going to do one last segment that we don't usually do. And I'm going to break this thing down for you and tell you guys how I would approach fishing it. And hopefully it'll help you out uh, out on those high school tournaments. So let's go ahead and just... Zoom in here real quick. These are those laydowns. Pretty good brush pile there. That one's our fish attractor. That one's right off the edge of that point. Uh, some more fish attractors up here. I believe there's 11 of them total. We've got additional laydowns going back in here. You got a lot of good points. I mean, you could literally just come in here and just fish the points and probably have some pretty good success. Another brush pile there, another one there. And then as we get in here, We've got more laydowns, just laydowns scattered throughout, right? So I don't want to wear you guys out just pointing out all the laydowns. I did mark all the ones that I could find. Um, but the one thing that, uh, that I did want to mark for you guys is obviously the docks as well. So you've got a couple docks over here. I know we're not going to talk about it too much, but there's not a lot of cover in this lake from the standpoint of just like docks and rocks and stuff like that. So take the time when you're out there fishing. If you see these docks, you know, stop and fish them. Stop and fish all of these docks if you can, if you're allowed to. Like this one, you might not want to go fish around because there's going to be a lot of people in there and things like that. But these little off docks that are out there, like this one down here, if there's nobody fishing off of it, definitely go up there and fish around to pound the heck out of it because there's probably some fish right around there. And that dock actually has a little point on it that we're going to talk about here in just a second, which is a perfect intro into the next segment. Let's switch over and look at this thing from iBoating. So the last part of this, before we start talking about strategy and just how I would approach fishing this lake, is to look at the contours and talk about the offshore hotspots. Now, like I told you before, with this being such a small lake, there aren't a ton of opportunities here uh, for us to be able to mark a lot of stuff for you. But there's a few places in here that I think are somewhat interesting and I would definitely spend some time going down and fishing them. So everything that we talk about here, I went ahead and put over on Google Earth. So we'll actually switch back real quick when we get done here and I'll show them to you on Google Earth just so you can see them. And then we're going to go ahead and jump in and talk a little bit about strategy 
at what I think might be the best approach uh, to fishing this lake. So let's go down here. Let's start at the dam. Obviously, you know, you, if you if you watch any of my lake breakdown videos or if you've even heard any, any fishermen talk, points are always good. Well, it's hard to tell here because you have quite a few points, like which point's going to be a good point. It's really hard to tell by the contours too. But I would say, you know, if you're looking at particular points to fish, obviously this right in here where they have the brush pile, um, right off of this point right here, I'll zoom in right here. This is going to be a good point to fish off of because you have that fish attractor that's there. As you go down here, you know, a lot of these points don't have a lot to them. Um, but if you look right here on this point, this one definitely has a nice little feeding table to it. So that's going to be a good point, at least based on the contours that I'm seeing here, a good point to go after. Now, as we move on up the, uh, the creek or the, uh, the lake here, you know, I don't see too many things again off these points or off these contours that sh that would just jump out to me to say, hey, you need to absolutely fish this point. But again, you could literally fish every one of these points in the lake and probably catch some fish. So let's go ahead and move in this one. Now, this one's a little bit better. You get a little bit flatter, a little bit more flatter tables there for them to fish off of. So maybe right there would be a good point. And as we move up, not seeing too much uh, up in here. I didn't see too much up here. I think there was one more mark, I believe, that I made for you that was up in here, and I can't remember where it was. I think it was just this point right here, just because this really where the main split is. And usually when you find a, a point like that, it's got decent depth, nine and a half feet. There could be some pretty good stuff in here. There could even be like a little break going on right in this area. Not sure. So let me go ahead and go down here to the west side, and I just want to show you. right here so i like this point and notice again it comes out a little bit further has a flat top that's not my favorite one there my favorite one if i'm really going to be looking offshore fishing is going to be right here nice big tabletop eight foot of water just looks good looks like a giant feeding table for the bass and there's actually when we switched over to google earth this is actually just outside there's a little dock right here and it's just outside of this dock, so you can kind of figure out how to locate that, especially if you're out here on your smaller boats, since you can't take the, uh, you know, the big old boats out here. Also, this point right here, this point looks like it has some potential as well. Maybe a little bit of a, of a ledge, not, not a ton of ledge, but a, a little bit of a ledge. Maybe you could check out there. And then moving down here, this point sticks out as well. You can see it's just like this one and this one. So definitely a good one to go explore around right in that area. Then we're going to move down and we kind of get down to the to the south end again uh, where we started. And there's a couple areas in here that I that I think you should go look at. Um, one, you've really got three major points that are going on right here underneath the water. And there's no telling if they're going to be out here or not. And, you know, there's no telling if there's any cover out here or not, because I can't tell from the mapping. But these are places where people would likely put some type of brush piles or fish attractors or stuff like that, because they're just set up perfectly for what the fish like and that's going to be this spot right here so if you see this point right here where my little hand is right here off the edge of this point the edge of this point and then over here you've got this point that comes out but really it's, it looks just like a giant flat so i guess you could just say it's a flat that comes way out and then it comes out to the edge right over here so there's about a three or four foot drop right in there so right in here right in here right in there i think are going to be your your three highest percentage areas so now let's go over and let's switch back to google earth real quick I'll show you those offshore waypoints then we're going to go jump out in the garage i'm going to talk to you about some baits hopefully i can put you on some fish all right switching back over really quick to google earth let's just look real quick here are the offshore spots that we just went through and talked about these are the key ones that i thought actually needed a point for you on the card or on this Google Earth breakdown. So I went ahead and marked them there. You can see them all. Just wanted to point them out to you really quick before we go over in the garage, do a little garage, talk about how to approach this lake. So let's do that now. Let's go jump out in the garage. Let's talk about six different baits that I would use on this lake if I were going to for my first time. Let's do it. All right, so I know I said that I was gonna go out to the garage, but that's not happening because it's too cold out there. So we're gonna do this thing in the office. So we've learned a lot about this lake, right? We've learned one that the Google Earth imagery that we have, the lake doesn't fluctuate very much. 
Um, so with that being said, we weren't able to pull it down that much and see a lot of things like we saw. But we do know that there's 11 brush piles out there that the Illinois State Park has put out there or fisheries or whatever you guys call it in Illinois. We do know those are out there. And so those are going to be, to me, key targets that I think you're going to want to focus on. If you can learn how to catch fish off those brush piles, you are going to be very successful out there because not every brush pile is going to have fish on it every single time. But if you can run that br those brush piles, just run all 11 of them and keep a rotation or maybe your best five, you run those best five, you're going to put yourself in a lot higher percentage chance of really catching some good quality fish and being around a lot of fish. So I definitely say focus on those brush piles big time. Also, focus on anywhere you can see any creek channels and stuff. I know we talked about that. I think there was only one maybe creek channel swing that was up a little bit further north. So I don't know if that's really going to come into play or not. But focusing on all of the timber, there's obviously tons of timber here. There's standing timber and there's a ton of laydowns as well. Um, even a bunch of laydowns that I'm sure I couldn't see from the, uh, you know, from the mapping. So on the laydowns, we've got some lures there to help you guys out with. That's just my guess, just based on what I'm seeing on this lake, that there's going to be a lot of a lot of flooded timber and, and laydowns and things like that. And then last but not least, down by the dam, you've got all those rocks. And those rocks, if you parallel them, meaning that you get your boat right up next to them, and then you cast <clears throat> down the bank line, parallel down the bank line, you do that with a square bill, I think you're going to have success down there as well. There's also that little community area. I think you could have success there. And then, last but not least, the docks. There were only, what, two or three docks, I think, on that lake. They're all just more just fishing platforms, but fish love to hang out around that stuff. And anytime you see those fishing platforms like that, you know there's going to be brush or something around that area that is going to attract the fish to it to allow those people on the bank to be able to catch fish and also to allow us on the boat to be able to catch fish as well. Now, the only thing I would say there is that if anybody is fishing on those piers, Stay away from them, guys. We got a boat. We can go anywhere we want. Just give them their peace. They don't have the option to go where we want to go. So just be respectful when you're out there. So let's go ahead and let's jump into the baits. I told you we'd had six different baits or techniques um, that I think are going to be really successful in this lake. And this is really how I would prepare myself for going out this lake for the very first time. So number one, I'm going to go ahead and grab it on here. I got to look down or I'll end up uh, poking myself. But we talked about the forge that was on this lake, right? We have the gizzard chad, which those gizzard chad, they can get just ginormous. I think up to like 18 inches, I believe. I'll pull up a graph and show you guys here. I believe that's what it is. And then also on the golden shiners, those are really small, right? Those are smaller type um, minnows or whatever you want to call them, bait fish. So for the golden shiners, I didn't have a particular bait because my boat's in the shop and I left my small crankbaits in there, but I would go with a really small square bill. Like if you, uh, if you ever pay attention to Six Sense, Six Sense has some really small crankbaits, like mini ones um, that you could throw on even, you could probably even throw it on one of those bait finesse ones if you wanted to. But I typically throw them on just like a seven foot medium, so something super light, tons of flex, but allows me to throw those tiny little crankbaits, get you a tiny little square bill that is in the gold color, and that is going to mimic your golden shiners. The bait I do have down here, because down here we do have gizzard chad, is going to be uh, this bait right here. This is a Lucky Craft. It's an LCRTO 2.0. It's a square bill. And this is definitely probably the first thing I'd throw if I was out there on that lake, if I was going around fishing, especially if I was fishing the bank line or up by that rip wrap, this is definitely the lure that I would be throwing. And the reason why is because it looks just like those gizzard chat. It was made to look like the gizzard chat. It's just an awesome, awesome crankbait. That doesn't mean you have to buy this particular crankbait. I'm not here to try to sell you lures or anything. Just get you a square bill and make sure that it either matches the gizzard chat or it matches the golden shiners. It's got to be one of the two. Don't go off with some crazy color. Let's, we're trying to get you a high percentage stuff, right? So even though it may look cool to your eye and you may think that that's the bait that you really need to get because it's super cool looking, don't do it. Go with the baits that match the hatch, all right? Go with the baits that match the hatch. And I'm going to be a total critic because in the spring, I would actually throw this but then I would also throw a red color. And that's about the only time I would throw a different color than what's actually there. And the red color is actually 
not to mimic the uh, the gizzard shad, but it's to mimic the crawfish. If you have any type of crawfish in there at all, they get red in the spring, and that is really a really good color to throw. We're going to talk about it in one of my baits here in just a second. But as far as the uh, square bills, just to keep you limited, almost got myself there, keep you limited, stick with the colors that are a golden shiner color, or they match the gizzard shad right there. Okay? I think that's going to help you guys. All right, next up. We're going old man style here because you asked me to break it down. I'm breaking it down for you. And these are tried and true lures that I know will catch me fish. They're lures that I have tied on all of the time. I don't go out for the fancy stuff. I go for the stuff that works. So number one, since we're getting into spring, I'm going to start off in the spring color and then I'll go over to the, uh, to the other color. But it's just going to be a regular spinnerbait. All right, just a regular spinnerbait. Now spinnerbaits are fire they especially in the springtime and one of the things that for me what's worked really well and is just kind of something that i learned over time from watching youtube videos and watching people fish and fishing with other people is that in the spring if you go with this little colorado blade that's got that red color on it i have no idea why but that just really really fires them up you can see this this spinnerbait's been chewed up pretty good it's almost done for the skirt, but man, that has been a very effective lure for me. And I think that's going to be very effective for you guys as well. So you're going to go out there, you're going to throw that out there and you're going to let it, let it fall. Don't just throw it out there and chuck it back in, let it fall. And then just kind of a medium pace. It's not a super fast pace. It's not a super slow pace. It's just a medium pace. And the main thing you're wanting to do there with that spinner bait is bounce off of stuff, intentionally throw it into junk that you know, you're, it's going to cause that bait. To, to react and fall and bump into stuff. That's when you're going to get your bites. And if you're not bumping into stuff, maybe you don't have anything to bump into or you didn't bump into anything, make it look like you bumped into something. So you're reeling it in, you stop it, and you fast jerk it, and then you reel it in a little bit and you stop it. You know, you're just giving that bait something different than just throwing it out and reeling it back in. That's going to be key to triggering those bites. Yes, you can get bites if you just go down the bank line, throw that spinnerbait, reel it in, throw it in, spinnerbait, reel it in. Yes, but you're going to get more bites if you're intentionally throwing at targets, bouncing off of targets, like bouncing off the stumps, bouncing off the laydowns, bouncing off the dock pillars. You're going to get a lot more bites doing that than you are by just going on the bank line and fast retrieving it back. I'm not saying the fast retrieve won't work. There's other ways to use a spinnerbait. You can fast retrieve it and burn it on the top and catch fish. You can slow roll it on the bottom. But I'm just trying to give you probably the higher percentage thing, at least for me, that would allow me to catch fish using that spinnerbait. So along with the spinnerbait, we get out of spring, we get more into summertime or maybe into the fall time. We're going to go away from that, that red color and really just go back to matching a hatch, right? We're trying to match that gizzard chat, and that is kind of what I'm going to go with there. Now, I might, I do have some gold blades on there. I was going to say, I might switch over to some really gold blades. Maybe some that are a little bit more gold. This one's more nickel and this one's more gold. But it would definitely be some type of a white and chartreuse uh, spinnerbait. And I like the double willow blades. All right. That is it for as far as quicker moving baits. Now, this next one, um, it's just a really good swim bait. And so that's what I think you could throw out there. I think you could do it because of all the cover. You're gonna, definitely going to have to go with a swim bait that has a hook that's not exposed. So my suggestion, and it can be anything, it can, you could use rage swimmers if you want to, um, and you can mess around with the sizes, right? Remember those golden shiners are the small ones, and then the gizzard shad are the bigger fish. So you could kind of mess around with, I've kind of got one that's like right in the middle. I think this is a four, eight or something like this, but this is a mega bass spark shad, and it's got a owner uh, willow spinner on the bottom of it probably just screwed that up whenever I'm trying to say here. I'm having a hard time talking because I'm on camera, but you get what I'm saying. It's got a little little blade on the bottom. And so basically what you do with this is very similar to that spinner bait, but I want you to roll, reel it in just a little bit slower. So throw it out and actually let it go down to the bottom and then just slowly reel it where this thing, you can feel this thing's ticking on stuff down there on the bottom, bumping into stuff. And that's when you know you're at a right pace and it's just a slow, steady pace, just letting it, bang off stuff if it hits a stump just keep it going telling you whew, you will get big bites big bites throwing those swim baits and that is just a really fun easy way to fish kind of like throwing a spinner bait you can have a good time with it all day and not get bored 
But we got one more fast one to show you, and then I'll switch over to the slow stuff. So the next moving bait um, that I want to show you is, is really a chatter bait. Now, this is the, the color for spring. Again, once spring's over, you're going to switch over to more of that white color. But I love this little red chatter bait. And you know, I've seen people throw chatterbaits a thousand different ways. And for me, the best way is to more of a slower roll. Again, more like I am with the swim bait where it's not super fast, but it's not super slow, but it's slow enough where I'm bumping into stuff. And if I'm bumping into stuff, that's typically how I'm going to get my bites. The other way that we've actually caught fish on this thing is to just throw it out. Maybe if you're out by that brush pile and you're out on the edges of it and you're not going to get hung up too bad, you can throw it out there and you can pop it. And when you pop it, it kind of <laughs> up and then it flows back down and they'll hit it on that fall. That might be a tricky way to do it out there because of all the cover that you're in. You're probably better off just slow rolling it, keeping it going so it's deflecting off a lot of stuff. So the chatterbait. So real quick, when we go to moving baits, we've got the chatterbait, we've got the swim baits. Make sure you do the flashy swimmer. That's what it was. Make sure you do the flashy swimmers because you need that hook protected. You don't want that exposed hook with all that brush out there. You've got your, your uh, spinner baits as well right here. Remember that red for spring, and then after spring's over, you're going to switch over to the whites. And then get you a square bill, get you one that matches the golden shiner if you can. On that one, you're going to go with the smallest one you can find. And then on the gizzard shad, I really like this Lucky Craft. Uh, what was it again? I forgot it again. It was an LCRTO 2.0. It's in that gizzard shad type color. I think that would be very, very successful with you guys out there. Now, these crankbaits, like I said, you're going to go up, you're going to throw them up around all that riprap that we talked about, and you're also going to use them when you're beating the bank to just bounce it off of stuff. Don't be scared to throw that lure up and let it bounce off the, the wood and stuff. That's what it was designed for. I know it seems crazy because you have all these dang hooks on it, and you think you're going to lose that really good bait, but I promise you, if you're working it right, it will bounce off of that stuff, and you'll have a lot of success with it, and you'll get a lot of bites. All right, that's it for the fast stuff. Let's move over and let's talk about two slower techniques that I think are gonna be fire for you. So the first one, I'm not gonna show you my favorite one first. I'll show you my favorite one last. The first one is, I have no idea why, but when I get on lakes that have a lot of this timber, this lay downs and stuff like that, the curly tail worm seems to do better for me. I don't know why. I have no idea why. I don't know if it's because of the way it comes over the, the stumps and stuff a little bit better and just gets a little better reaction. I have no idea why, but this is definitely what I would go with. I'd go with this little reddish color, and you could throw this all year long. And I, you don't have to go with this exact brand. Um, you can go with any brand that you want. I think this is, I can't even remember now. Um, but anyways, you can go with any color you want, really any color you want, but any brand you want. But I'd stick with that the reddish color, and then I'd probably go with more of like a, a watermelon green color, and that'd probably be my standard colors for that lake. So definitely springtime, though, I'm starting off with this color. You're just going to Texas rig this thing. It's pretty simple. You just take the flat part and pay, face it towards the bend. You know, we've, we've gone through this a bunch, but you just go up to where that, that uh, first line is that's right there. You're just going to poke it in, and then you're going to bring it back over this way, putting this on an EWG 3 odd hook. And then I'm just going to line it up and figure out where that hook goes through my bait in that last little rivet right there. Then that is where I'm going to insert my hook at. And then I'm just going to pull it up right there and just tuck it in just a little bit. And that's going to allow me to basically go take that worm, put it on a, put it on a, a weight, put on like an eighth ounce, or probably for you, I'd probably go quarter ounce. Let's go start off with a quarter ounce. You don't want anything too heavy because you want to be able to work it around and be able to feel stuff pretty good. You start off with a quarter ounce. If that's not heavy enough, maybe go up to a three-eighths ounce. But just throw this out there and literally just work it in the brush piles. You're literally going to throw past the brush pile, and then you're going to bring it to the brush pile and work it up those limbs. So when it comes up the limb, you're just working it up the limb. And as soon as you feel that worm drop or that weight drop off that limb, as soon as you feel that, let your rod down. All right, so you know what I'm talking about. You'll reel it in, you think you're hung up, you keep pulling and all of a sudden you just lose it. As soon as you lose it, don't keep that rod tip up here like this. Let it fall. And the reason why I'm doing that is because you're letting this thing free fall. If you keep that rod tip up, you might keep this thing from being able to free fall. So keeping that rod tip down just allows this to naturally do whatever it wants to do. 
and you're going to get a lot more bites that way. So just go out. It's cheap now. I think you can get it for two or three bucks, but go out and get you just some ribbon tail worms. These may even be the culverts. I can't remember, but uh, anyways, go out, get you a ribbon tail worm. This is probably like a six inch worm. This will be dynamite all year long. I have no idea why fish bite worms, but it's the number one bait for sure. All right. Then last but not least, my favorite and a technique that I think is going to do you a lot of good, especially on that lake, is going to be the baby brush hog on a shaky head. So I already have one rigged up, so you can see it here. <clears throat> it's in like a, a gold color. So you can see here it's like a yellowish gold. And what I've done is I've just put that on a quarter ounce shaky head and then just screwed it in right there. So I'll pull this off and show you what this brush hog looks like but this is a baby brush hog by zoom it's the only way to go you can throw any color you want it doesn't matter i just like this color because to me this color looked like that golden shiner i think they call this yellow perch um, or yellow magic or something like that but anyways if i remember i'll put the uh the comment the, i'll put the description of this bait down in the comment so we're just going to get you a quarter ounce shaky head. This is a sand tone, but you can use whatever you want. Just make sure on your shaky head, you go with the round head. Okay. The round head means a lot to me. It's been a lot more effective to me. I don't get hung up as easy, all that good stuff. And then also make sure that when you rig up your brush hog, that you do not leave your hook out. So you're not fishing open water here. You're fishing all kinds of gnarly junk. So what you want to make sure to do is get that, get that hook in there. And make sure that it's not exposed. You don't want it out here like this. See how it's exposed right there? You don't want it like that. You're going to have to pull it up just a little bit and just barely hide it. And now what you can do is you can either work that like a Texas rig and just work it through the trees, kind of drag it on the bottom. Or for me, the most effective way to use this bait is to throw it out, let it go to the bottom, reel it in and get just a little bit of a slack, just, just enough bow in your line to where it's just a little bit, and then you're gonna pop it twice, one, two, and then you're gonna feel it go up, and then you're gonna feel it come back down and hit the bottom. And get used to that cadence. It's, it's usually, what, two or three seconds. So you pop it up, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, usually somewhere in there, it hits the bottom. Well, if you pop it up, and it's like five seconds, and it still hasn't hit the bottom, reel in super fast and set your hook. They're going to usually hit it after you've popped it up, and it's fallen back to the bottom. And it's a very unique bite. It's just a small little just tick. You'll just, it, it almost feel like you hit a rock on the way down when you were falling, and you just clip the rock just barely. And it just, just enough to where you just barely felt the smallest little tick right on your line. If you feel that, that is a bite. You need to reel down and jack them. This is going to catch you some fish, man. I promise you, this is going to be very, very good to you guys. Go out and get you some baby brush hogs. Get you some ribbon tail worms. If you're on a budget, those two are going to catch you fish. And then if you can splurge a little bit, go get you some square bills. Go get you some spinner baits. And get you some swim baits. But make sure that you do the flashy swimmers and make sure that you keep that hook completely, completely covered up. All right, so... I think that covers it for everything. I'm looking down here, just making sure I have everything. I believe we've covered everything on this lake. We've talked about the breakdown. We've talked about how to approach it, the lures we would need. Hopefully that's everything you need, Lane. Hopefully, if you would, please share this with other team members on your bass team. I'm hoping it helps you guys. And until next time, I hope you catch your PB. Take it easy, everyone.